So thank you for inviting me to talk to you. It's, um, it's great to be here. Um, I actually haven't visited the gallery for quite a few years, so um, it's not because I didn't want to, it's just that I haven't had the time. Um, I'm grateful to the organisers for um, looking after me today. We had a nice lunch at the Hamilton Club. I'm not really familiar with this community and I can't really give you any advice in terms of the future. Um, I do know Danny McCowan uh, through our sector. He is highly respected and this collection, of course, is a very important um, collection in Australia. So um, it's great to be here and thank you once again. So let's start with the pictures, if she can do it all. Okay, so there's a quaint little gallery. Um, and if you look at the cars, you might be able to work out the date of this photograph. So let's say it's in the, in the mid uh, 20th century. This is the gallery that I guess um, we wanted to un un reveal um, not long after I started because that's not what I saw when I got there. Uh, that's what existed. So if you can imagine that gallery that you saw in the black and white shot behind is behind that uh, rather ugly and brutal facade. And so um, the next stage was to demolish it. But we also had this, oh goodness. So if you've seen the Bendigo Art Gallery lately, you will know that um, the site is incredibly different to the way it was back in the 60s. So the creamy brick facade was demolished and uh, we revealed the original Victorian facade, which was built in 1887, 1867. And the ANA motor inn was demolished to uh, make way for a late 1990s um, redevelopment. So I started at the gallery in um, 1996 as the curator and I was basically supposed to be there for one year, um, but I'm still there, uh, so 19 years later. So here we go. So Tony Elwood and I um, arrived in 1996 and Tony of course is now the director of the National Gallery in Melbourne. And one of the first things that happened was that uh, there was a plan in place. So really, I, I guess I, there's a lot to tell you because it's been two decades and you're at the very beginning of starting to do something new with your gallery potentially. But when I moved to Bendigo in the 90s, it was uh, a fairly depressed place. Um, I had probably been there once in my life. I went for a on a school excursion and uh, we did not go to the art gallery. We went to the Bendigo Pottery and we went to the, um, I think, the Joss House and uh, we were billeted out, which would never happen these days, to families and it was really not a very interesting uh, excursion. We took a ride on the tram, which you can still do. And I remember thinking to myself, it's probably not a city I'll ever go back to. That's just how I felt. Um, but of course, amalgamation occurred in the mid 90s and that really started to save Bendigo. Bendigo had um, not a great deal going for it back then. So part of amalgamation meant that we had a greater rate base and uh, there was more money to, to spend on institutions such as the art gallery. The gallery originally was a private company and when I started there in, 2000, in 1996, um, there were probably about 14,000 people visiting on an annual basis, somewhere between 10 to 14,000. So we're, we're up around 120, I think, at this point. Here we go. So this is probably around the, mid, the late 90s. We've revealed the building. So that was the first big step. You can't see it. That's why I said it looks better in the dark, but... Um, Inside we have some beautiful gallery spaces, which unfortunately you don't have. But the architecture, the Victorian architecture is really important to our story because the Bendigo Art Gallery was established in 1887, but the actual original building was built in 1867. And of course, with the, the gold rush and the history of the region, it's really important to have these historical buildings still standing and to have them um, conserved. And so part of the project was to really restore the interior of the existing buildings. Not only did we have a creamy brick facade attached to the outside, we also had linoleum, lino tiles on the floor, um, hessian attached to the walls. Uh, and then they put a yellow carpet over the top. So 
the plan was basically to refurbish the interior and remove the carpet and the lino. It was a big job. Oh, we've gone right through to the cafe now, but I'll just say to you, the Premier of the day, Jeff Kennett, had a bit of a vision for Bendigo Art Gallery and uh, he got behind the project and funded out of, um, I guess, well, state government funded one million of the project. So you do have to start thinking about money for this particular um, journey that you're embarking upon because you're going to need it. Um, if we rebuilt our gallery now, it would cost much more, but we've done it over a period of two decades. So I don't know what it would cost to build what we have there. Has everyone been there? Yes, good. I'll just go through to the interior. So if you look through that little archway at the end, you're looking inside what we call Bolton Court, uh, which is that original building. And that's our contemporary collection. So I wanted to talk to you about three different things. There's a bit of history for the about the gallery, but in terms of where you are and where we were, I think one of the keys um, to the success probably of Bendigo Art Gallery has been the community. And it's really important to build that. Um, it's not just about the people who work at the gallery. It, it's about the volunteers. It's about these people, you, the people in this room. It's about the people who believe in a future for the institution. And we have a membership of about 1,300. It's grown from a much smaller membership but there is a huge commitment um, from the people of Bendigo to see this gallery realise its potential. And I think the council at the time of amalgamation realised that there was an art con collection that was very significant. So you're in that place. You have a really significant art collection here and it, it can't be understated. Um, your director has actively collected not only has he purchased, he's received gifts on your behalf. So this is a, w a wonderful asset. It's not a municipal asset because it probably will never be sold, hopefully. It, it's more about um, its cultural value to the fabric of this city. So I've been building our contemporary collection and Danny's been collecting all sorts of other things. I think he also collects contemporary art. But I notice he has um, international art and... I think it's a really interesting collection that we don't know about as much as we should. And of course you have amazing benefactors who have given so much to this gallery since its um, inception. Contemporary art is what we collect because it's what we can afford. Historical art is harder for us. Um, when I talk about community, I talk about volunteers and staff, and you have uh, some great staff. I met, met the staff here today. This is our education officer. She predates me. She started way before. Um, she also teaches at the Bendigo Senior Secondary College, but she specialises in, in the secondary education for, the, for students at the gallery and interprets our collection very well. Uh, we also have uh, another part-time education officer who looks after our primary school children and kindergarten age children. So <coughs> all ages of the community are important. Now you're a growing... No, you're not a growing population and you're an ageing population. So you have some challenges because part of the key to the success of Bendigo is the fact that people are moving to that part of the world with young families. Uh, as a result, there is greater demand for facilities and infrastructure, such as the Bendigo Hospital. The Bendigo Hospital is one of the largest um, infrastructure builds in the history of Victoria. We're talking about $630 million that is being spent on that hospital. But it will service the needs of a, a very broad um, spectrum of the community. So we have a couple of other things that um, are unique. The Bendigo Bank reinvented itself in that time that I've been there. Um, it's gone from being a, a small building society to something that is, well, we like to call it one of the, one of the big banks, but it's obviously the, the fifth bank, but it's not one of the big banks. And um, what's interesting now is that competitors such as, um, we're talking about this today, Westpac is, is pushing Bank of Melbourne as a community bank. And it's really interesting to see that happening. Uh, Bendigo Bank has built its headquarters now, a very substantial commitment to Bendigo. And uh, part of this 
whole idea, I think, about community is that you have the support of organisations within uh, within your reach, and the bank is a supporter of the art gallery, as is um, Feline. We need to get people to Bendigo. You have a fabulous airport. We don't have that. Um, but I, I think part of the issue, I think, that Patrick raised is it's, it's where you are in Victoria. You are not an hour and a half out of Melbourne. And so that's been one of the benefits for us, to be able to draw on a Melbourne audience and capture the imagination of Melbourne. So we move along. Children, as I said, are really important. I don't know how well the schools are serviced in this community, but we make sure that we outreach to all of the schools, that when we have exhibitions such as the Archibald Prize, what we had for two years, that all of the kids came, because portraiture is something that um, children learn about at school. And I think that um, if you wanted to activate the community, one way to do it is to encourage the Archibald Prize to come here, probably saying all the wrong things. Um, <laughs> what happened a few years back, I um, went to Bernie Brooks at Meyer because, of course, Sydney Meyer started in Bendigo. And the idea was to talk to him about sponsorship for a fashion, um, fashion exhibition that I was doing at the time. And he said, uh, well, that's OK, Karen. I'm, I, I can give you a small amount of money, but I want you to take the Archibald Prize. I want you to take it to Bendigo. And so I said, sure, I'll take the Archibald Prize. I moved heaven and earth to take the Archibald Prize. The Archibald Prize at the time, what happens there is that in Sydney it's shown and then it tours usually, it tours regional um, New South Wales. But there was an opportunity, because of the mural hall, I think it was, to show it somewhere else. So I said yes. And although people say, oh, well, it's not always good, it actually is great for a community if, if your gallery can take it. And it needs scale, it needs size. And so what happened was I took it and that meant that it wasn't an expensive uh, venture, but it was certainly a popular one. So we only had it for four weeks, which is a short time frame. It brought in 40,000 people. So, and it also brought in $40,000. So what I did is I, I, I said, rather than charge admission, we put a donation box at the front and asked for a gold coin. And most people put in a gold coin. So we did it again the next year, and I had it on for six weeks. So how much did it raise? $60,000, and 60,000 people roughly came. So you can't go wrong. It's whether you want to go down that path. But what that did for us is it proved that people will travel. They will travel, and they will stay, and they will go out for dinner, and they will walk around your city, and they will buy things. And that's what it proved to us. I didn't take it again after that because we have our own prizes. So, like I said, community, I can't emphasise enough because in the end, if all that's left standing is the, ga is the gallery and there's a decision made to perhaps sell off the collection because the city can't survive. Now, this is actually happening in Detroit. Um, I don't know if you know about Detroit, but deindustrialisation, a bit like Bilbao. Um, the idea behind an art collection um, just sitting there and not doing anything uh, when, when a city is bankrupt. That city is absolutely bankrupt. The motor industry has moved out. It, they call it the white flight. People have moved out of the central part of the city and the art gallery is still there. It's the Detroit Art Institute. And it has an amazing collection. It has paintings by Diego Rivera, who was Frida Kahlo's partner. So it's, it's just too, too good to see, to see it sold off. But all I'm saying to you is a community, what they need now is the community to rally around it, and it's happening. But it's important that you do have that at the beginning. So I can't emphasise it enough because that's really what Bendigo has, uh, why the Bendigo Art Gallery has um, positioned itself in the place that it is. So these are some of our members. As you can see, it is an older demographic, but it was the Governor-General after all. <laughs> and of course, Grace Kelly. Well, here we go. Grace Kelly proved to us that people would travel not only from interstate, they would travel from overseas, Hong Kong, New Zealand. Um, that was exciting. So um, 
I guess with exhibitions such as this, and fashion is something that I've really pursued for the gallery because if you go back to the 90s when regional galleries were what they were then, um, the Ballarat Art Gallery always had the Eureka flag. It always had the gold story sewn up. It had Sovereign Hill. We had this watered down version. It was called Sandhurst Town. It was pathetic. I can say that now because it's something else. It's been turned into something else. Actually, it's been turned into a grand stupor, okay, if you're a Buddhist. Um, so it's amazing that we didn't, we didn't have anything to hang our hat on. And part of the, the plan at that time was to find a point of difference and to reinvent what we had. So that happened very quickly. The building was built, but then what do you do? How do you bring people in? So exhibitions of an international nature, I decided that that would be our point of difference. And we're probably one of the only regional galleries to really be pursuing that. Newcastle was doing it for a while, but um, I don't think they have a director at the moment, so things have changed there. Um, but this model has worked for us. And I started with photography, which is relatively easy to bring in, two-dimensional works, if you're bringing in works from London. And when I say inexpensive, it was affordable at the time. So I started with an exhibition. Well, we first had Eve Arnold. We had Cecil Beaton. We had the world's most photographed. And then I ventured into fashion because my background is fashion. I started at the National Gallery of Victoria and I worked in the Department of Fashion and Textiles. So every gallery director brings an interest to a collection and that was mine. So fashion... This is not art, this is celebrity. So how did this one happen? Again, it was um, Melvin didn't want it. It's as simple as that. Melvin, Melvin couldn't take it, Acme couldn't take it, the National Gallery didn't want it. And so Bendigo took it. And that's because I'd had um, two fashion exhibitions prior. And this was all about Grace Kelly's wardrobe. Fairly dowdy clothes, I have to say. <laughs> That's what someone said as they walked out. Gee, they're dowdy, but she was beautiful. So, But it was the story of the princess. It was the story of the actress. It's if you don't... I think you should go and see Nicole Kidman's film. But um, I think that the exhibition highlighted um, people's interest. It's, it's all about reality. They want to know more about the person. So I spent a bit of time in Monaco looking at the archive um, of film and I put together all of their Super 8s, all their holiday films, and did a whole slice, and a great story. So the film and the footage was probably the most interesting part of the exhibition because you saw her with her family and being a normal person. We've had many, many shows. I, I, there's far too many to, to talk about, but this one was um, an incredibly beautiful exhibition about Hilda Ricks Nicholas, Australian female artist. Do you know who that is? Bill Henson. Controversial. Um, Bill Henson's work is in our collection and this is Bill Henson talking to students uh, from Bendigo, secondary students, who were captivated with his work and asked many interesting questions. So it was quite, quite an interesting session. And there's Helen again. John Wolvesley is a local artist, so engaging with locally based artists who also have big profiles nationally. It helps. These are uh, some primary school students visiting John at his studio in the Whipstick, which is just out of Bendigo. Um, an exhibition of photographs here, again, students, they're 3D photographs, so hence the glasses. One of the other projects that I have in Bendigo, we don't have a museum of history, so I set up um, a small satellite space which um, shows uh, were, um, uh, let me say, archives and collections that do not, are not within the city's remit. So we have a history space, we tell the story of various things. We've just, the one we have on at the moment is all about the history of medicine in Bendigo and the beginning of uh, the dentistry. The, uh, it's very appropriate given that we're building a hospital. Um, so I guess for these students, seeing this work was quite, when you think about technology, this is old technology. A stereograph is um, a very old piece of technology uh, that people view. It's like a viewer and it gives you, a, it was very much part of the 19th century. So the students were fascinated, just like they are with record players and tape decks and all those <laughs> things. 
That's the post office. So I called that that space the post office gallery. We have a little space right. That's it there, and uh, it's manned by volunteers or peopled by volunteers um, look after that space for us. And I have a curator who puts together the exhibitions, and that's our brand. Uh, for the post office gallery, and there's some of the shows that we did have done. Um, you see the brass band, the rail, um, archaeological excavations in Bendigo, uh, looking at the identity, the naming of Bendigo, those sorts of programs. And attendances, well, look at that spike. Um, that happened when we had Grace Kelly. Uh, so right up there. Now, Grace Kelly, uh, when uh, we had to do a, um, an economic study, it injected 16 million into the local economy. It's just extraordinary. People put extensions on their restaurants. They couldn't cope. It was amazing. The demand, and I, I was abused because uh, they couldn't get water. I mean, we actually had queues. It was ridiculous. And I think you've got to be prepared. If you go down the path and it's really successful, you have to deal with success just as hard as failure. <laughs> It's a really good problem to have. That's when you need the community to help. I had lots of volunteers um, helping me, and particularly we had the golden age of couture and we had queues that were doing a serpentine around the building practically because people wanted to get in and see the show and I didn't have time ticketing. Uh, it was an extraordinary problem, but it was, it was a dream. You dream about queues when you have an art gallery. I came in here today and there was hardly, any, there was no one, no one in this gallery. So it, it, it's a dream and uh, it, you can make it a reality. You can get close. You've got to aim really high though. So here we go. So once you have a few successes, government starts to look at you. <laughs> They're interested because you, you make them look good. Uh, so the state government in particular has been interested in us because it's an interesting case study to see the transformation and the reinvention of the art gallery within the community. And so this is the um, beginning of our most recent uh, redevelopment. There's nothing there. Wait a moment. Wrong button, Karen. There we go. This is an artist's rendering of what we now have built. Uh, so Grace Kelly finished and up went the um, fences and they closed all the back of the gallery and we had 18 months of building, okay? It was an $8.5 million project um, and again, because of the success, because we built, we built upon it and built upon it, it's layered now, we received 3.75 million from the state government and an equivalent from the local government and then philanthropic. So about 1.4 million from the philanthropic from our foundation and little fundraising activities. Here's the back of the gallery. That's box iron bark, that's our local timber. It's attached, that's Carl Fender's little piece of Feature, futuristic, I'm looking at you, yes. architecture. I hope you're a fan of Carl Fender. Okay, Fender Cats Elitis, of course, did Mona, the building, and they also did the Ian Potter Gallery at the University of Melbourne. Uh, these are, this is an interior shot of our new gallery, so please come and visit and see our contemporary collection, which is, oh well, currently on display, but about to go off display, sorry about that. Um, we're bringing in an exhibition from the British Museum, which is called The Body Beautiful in Ancient Greece. And we're bringing in the discus thrower, the Discopolis, and he will be positioned in one of the, our new galleries. This is the back, this is our cafe, as a private operator uh, who does a very, he has worked every day, the recent exhibition, Genius and Ambition, he worked absolutely every day. He was full every day. In fact, every cafe around us was full every day. And uh, he, he was looking for, I saw him on the last day of the show in the exhibition. I said, what are you doing, Renzo? And he said, I haven't seen the show. I wanted to have a look before. <laughs> I haven't had a day off, Karen, for 14 weeks. So that was nice. It's a good, again, it's a good problem um, to have. And more of our contemporary collection. Uh, that's the racking system that we have put in place underground. So underneath the 650 square metre gallery is a great racking system. That's actually not our collection. That's an image of the racking system that we bought. I don't have a shot of our racking system to show you, so I just, I've given you that. But that's the, basically the brand. If you know about racks, um, 
the curators, the people here from the gallery, will understand these racks actually work like a compactor, so they take up less room. Normally what happens is a rack is pulled out and it takes up double the space, but these just move along and it's quite a great system. And Genius and Ambition was a great uh, exhibition that we've just closed on Monday. We had 44,000 people. We, we think it injected about 3.3 million into the local economy. Um, and there's a big thank you for staff, volunteers and anyone who was involved tomorrow night at the Art Gallery, which should be fun. That exhibition I initiated back in 2009. It was a collaborative project with the Royal Academy of Arts in London, which is the oldest artist educating institutions. Um, it was set up in 1768. And what I did, I've always had an interest in expatriate art, artists. So I was interested in um, why our Australian artists left Australia and went and studied at the RA or exhibited it at the RA. And I've always had a fascination with it, always will, or the Paris salons. And uh, it's a very romantic notion to travel. And they were leaving places like Bendigo and Adelaide and Melbourne and discovering another life in places like Paris and London. So why was the Royal Academy important to our Australian artists? That's what the exhibition was about. Who went? There's three people, that's good. You've, you've added to the Bendigo economy. Okay, so and I've also painted our rooms blue, which was a bit of a shock to some people, particularly our guides, but they recovered. And of course, students came uh, from all the schools. It's really important to engage young people in galleries. And that's something we've been pretty successful with. End of story. Okay, that's my son. So I think the most important thing to remember I took my children, you don't have to remember this, but I just a little anecdote. I took my children to Sydney to see the Sydney Biennale. And we went out to Cockatoo Island and we looked at everything and they were exhausted by the end of it. But we did find ourselves in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And uh, Jasper sat down in front of this painting and he decided that this was the most exciting picture that he'd seen in the whole Biennale. Of course, it wasn't part of the Biennale. Um, <laughs> His fascination with it is the scale and how on earth did those artists paint that? Well, how did they do it? Were they up on ladders? So we had a long discussion about that and I think the most important aspect about art is, is that relationship between you and it. That's it. That's the point. It gives people great pleasure. It's a therapeutic thing and it, it's intangible. It can't be quantified in any way. Governments won't understand it. It's, uh, it's, it needs to have equal weight with the economic benefits. And my advice to you is that ensure that your community is wrapped around this project from the beginning and uh, all of those benefits will follow if you get it right. And I think I've had a look at some of the ideas and I think you're on the right track. So thank you for listening to me. <laughs>